My name is Ken Mayer. I'm going to be your instructor for this course. A little bit about my background. I've been in this industry in some form or another since the very early 80s, which I realize, for many of you, that makes you think, well, he must be old. Okay. Well, in the 80s, things were a lot different than they are today, but uh, over time, I've uh, seen my work going from uh, basically workstations to uh, you know our uh, big database servers that we had back then, going into uh, network operating systems with Novell and then Microsoft, and then eventually moving into the network infrastructure where I do a lot of work uh, either directly for companies like Cisco or Juniper uh, or Palo Alto Networks or uh, IBM or going around the world and doing the same type of work. So I have a lot of experience when it comes to, uh, especially on the focus of security, with the uh, security that I've seen evolve over time with operating systems on working with all of these different vendors with their security products, whether it's their firewalls or understanding how to lock down their routers and switches, to uh, your storage devices with uh, Cisco or with IBM, and again looking at security issues and the deployment options we have. Again, working with service providers all around the world uh, with uh, companies like Cisco and Juniper and some of their, again, even on the Juniper side with their firewall bases, and it goes on and on. So what I'm hoping to say is that I've had the opportunity to see a lot of different types of vendors that are involved in the world of security. I've got to see a variety of different types of deployments and network designs, and I hope that I can take a lot of that experience and help uh, add that into this course that we're going to talk about, which is the CompTIA's Advanced Security Practitioner. Now in this lesson, we're going to take a look at enterprise security architecture. And so what we're going to see is basically uh, looking at it uh, as far as the basics of what we should look at in enterprise security. We're going to take that and put it into an enterprise structure and then also talk about what some of the minimum requirements should be for enterprise security. So in this topic, we're going to take a look at the basics of enterprise security. That means first we'll make sure we understand the nomenclature, the different components, that is the enterprise itself, what we mean by enterprise security, business goals and security, some of the uh, common enterprise security principles. Uh, we'll take a look at the uh, enterprise threat intelligence and then have the discussion about what to protect. And when I have that discussion, it doesn't mean that there are some things we don't care about, but some things are more important. So we're going to put some priorities in uh, what to protect. Uh, we're going to take a look at providing defense in depth. We'll uh, make sure that you understand that it's more than just buying a, a platform like a firewall. There's certainly other things we can do. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the common components of your enterprise security solutions. Take a look at it from the administrative side with policies, standards, and procedures. And then talk about some of the enterprise policy types that you should be uh, encouraging those at the top of this uh, organization to uh, be able to uh, set up and have uh, ready to enforce. So when we talk about the enterprise, uh, and of course, for those of you who are Star Trek fans, it's not what it sounds like. That's basically what we call your company. Now, it says right here, very first one, large, complex organization. Well, okay, it could be. Um, I, I mean, but it can also be a small uh, mom and pop shop that uh, might have some sort of presence on the web that needs security. Uh, but basically, the enterprise is your company, your organization. Now, you know, that just simply means that, uh, in this case, provides services or goods. So it doesn't mean it's all e-commerce out there, like an Amazon.com or something like, uh, large uh, as an organization there. It could simply be that you provide uh, cloud services. So, you know, you're out here in the Internet world, and you've created some virtual machines, and you have customers that are uh, connecting to uh, maybe run different applications that you have available to them. And, you know, you might be doing this out of your garage. All right, well, I hope you aren't. But anyway, uh, you know, so that's kind of what they mean by the enterprise. Uh, it could be uh, a multinational company that we're dealing with. Multinational sim simply means that we have lots of these local area networks. Maybe one of them is headquarters, another local area network over here uh, on, on different continents. And we're going through what I'm going to hope that this little globe is uh, indicating the uh, World Wide Web. And so we have connectivity either going out through this World Wide Web, uh, where, uh, of course, that's also where my hackers live and uh, might be trying to uh, intercept or destroy your traffic or even attack you. You might be using service providers to provide a uh, specific wide area network connection. So those little SPs are service providers, and maybe they're providing your connectivity 
all the way through uh, from uh, one location to the other. It could be a combination of both, where perhaps uh, one of these, instead of uh, designated as the LAN, let's uh, designate it as your web farm. And so, you know, now we're hoping for the customers to come into your web farm to uh, do whatever e-commerce. What I'm hoping to be able to illustrate here with all of the scribbling that I'm giving you is that there are a number of ways that we can try to uh, describe what an enterprise is. But all in all, what I hope I've described is that it is a single company or organization that uh, we are working for that we're trying to secure. And it doesn't have to be that it spans multiple geologic, uh, yeah, geological locations. It doesn't have to mean that. When we say enterprise, like I said, it could be a small company that has uh, just you know, one brick and mortar location and uh, having employees there. It doesn't necessarily have to employ a large number of individuals. So it sounds like I'm speaking in contrary to what uh, you actually see being presented here. And I am in a way, I'm, I'm kind of saying, you know, there are other definitions of the enterprise. But what we're going to take a look at it as, as a large organization so that we can uh, get a full um, idea of all of the areas that we need to look for uh, when it comes to security. Now, when we talk about enterprise security, we're going to take a look at it from what a lot of us like to say is the top-down approach. Now, top-down approach simply means that at the very top of this organization, what we may call the C-level uh, people, the CEOs, CIOs, CFOs, C-levels, that they should be concerned in making certain that they have proper implementation of security. But you see, when you look at it from the top up here, you should see all these different facets of security. I mean, for some of us, depending on the uh, types of uh, jobs that uh, we may be working with, we might be sitting over here looking at the uh, PCs, the operating systems, and talking about security from that aspect. When we talk about the security, you know, we're going to probably uh, list things like antivirus software loaded onto each of these machines. We might even talk about host-based intrusion detection systems uh, loaded on these machines. Uh, we may talk about uh, security or securing the uh, web browsing, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and that's great, uh, but that's only a piece of the security. And by the way, there's many more things that we can look at. I was actually talking about solutions that we'd have to install uh, as opposed to uh, policies like acceptable use uh, types of policies, but that's uh, something we have a discussion on a little bit uh, afterwards. Now, some of the other things we have to look at is uh, maybe what I'd call document security. Now, you know, document security to me might be, uh, or at least to some of you, you might be thinking of how it's stored or the storage uh, of where it's at. And by the way, I could relate that back to the PCs. Uh, if these uh, computers, or let's say they were laptops, and they have documents that are uh, inside of them that are very important, that's where we start thinking of encryption. By the way, if you can't tell, that was a padlock that I just drew. Uh, other things about um, uh, storage, of course, would be the permissions. You know, who has the rights to view what information? Uh, you know, it, uh, also how we transmit that information, whether we uh, transmit it securely or not. Uh, you know, it just uh, kind of continues to, uh, as I said, give you an idea that um, at the top of this level, at the top of this, we have to uh, look at it as all aspects of security, where some of us might be more focused on certain areas because that's within our job responsibilities. Again, uh, let's talk about access. Uh, access to these documents, whether it's from the inside or the outside. Again, I kind of already made that uh, hint with uh, permissions of who gets to view, who gets to access. Even, you know what, uh, you'd have to ask the question, who's allowed to create different types of content as well? Um, and, and then, of course, from there, we still have to worry about, uh, well, I'm going to assume, just looking at this here, physical, because I, I see a picture of a door. Uh, right, or, or somebody trying to break in and get it access, right? That goes back to the theft of our information. Uh, you know, I always tell somebody that um, if I can get into your server room, I don't care how good your network security is. If I can touch a server, if I can touch a router, if I can touch a firewall, I own it. And if I own it, then uh, I can do anything I want to with your data, with your information. And there's many other areas that I could probably continue to move into when we uh, talk about enterprise security. But we got to, like I said, look at it in this whole picture 
uh, so that we understand what's, uh, what we really have to, uh, uh, to talk about with security. You know, and, and like I said, we still can get into the whole uh, transportation. If I were to just call these lines, instead of kind of this uh, organizational chart, if I were just to call this your network, you know, your routers and switches that are making them all interconnect, we have to make sure that we are maintaining our security all the way through, even with the communications that uh, are making all of this happen and possible for us. So, uh, oh, and physical, I'm also going to put policies because we're going to talk about policies in a bit as well. So this is um, kind of the, um, a, a great overview of where we need to go in our discussions about enterprise security. All right, so let's take a look at business goals and security. And, and what that means is that, uh, again, if we look at it from the top of our organization going down, and that's how we should enforce all of our security, by the way, is in a top down, if I haven't already said that. That means that we have to have some sort of a strategy, maybe a business strategy that talks about how we're going to secure information. Now, the first thing you have to remember about security, and, and I've got to say this, because the most important thing that we have to do for our enterprise is make sure that our enterprise is profitable. We have to meet the business needs. That means if my company makes widgets and I decide that, you know, I'm going to lock things down so much that I affect the ability for that company to be able to build the widgets, then my company doesn't make money. It doesn't make money, I probably don't have a job anymore. So there's a business strategy that we have to be aware of. Now that business strategy might have some uh, other regulations, depending on the country that the uh, business is operating in, that it has to fulfill. So there are some requirements that we also have to include in that. The business strategy might have a risk management type of study that's been done to be able to determine what we can do to uh, lower our risks to keep this company making widgets. Now, all of that becomes kind of the, um, I guess you could say, the objectives. What do we want to see happen after we come up with this strategy for uh, not only keeping the company running, but for the security aspects and putting that together as our security solution? Now, a lot of these things like the uh, business impact study or the risk uh, assessment that I just talked about, uh, can uh, help you in creating those objectives. And those objectives often will become uh, listed as part of our security policy. And it's from that security policy that we use as a blueprint to be able to come up with the security solutions that we need to be able to put it all together. And by the way, it has to work together. One feeds the other, feeds the other. And again, the goal always is to help maintain business needs. Some of the common security principles that we look at, the first one is called the CIA triad. Now, that always sounds cool because think, thinking about spies with the Central Intelligence or, uh, uh, Agency, but that's not what it is. Uh, what we look at is that we have some sort of uh, asset, whether it's data, whatever it is. We have something that's important to us, and we want to protect it. And so the reason they call it a triad, so I drew it as a triangle, is that we look at the C, the C stands for confidentiality. And the confidentiality can uh, be a lot of different things. It could be the encryption of data. It could be the uh, place in which we store the data. It could be the policies or the permissions uh, that we apply to the uh, data or the asset uh, that we're trying to keep uh, safe. And then we have the I, the uh, integrity. Now, the integrity means that we want to have some assurances that maybe the uh, data hasn't been maliciously or accidentally changed. Do we have some checks and balances in there? Or if I'm transmitting this information across a network, confidentiality would often mean, as I said, encryption, and then we'd have some sort of a hashing function, uh, which uh, would uh, help us be able to verify that the data wasn't altered in transit. Now, the A part of it, all right, there's going to be some discussion over this. Some of you may uh, say, oh, no, no, Ken, that's not at all what we were told. Uh, all right, so let me give you one of it. One of them is availability. All right, so it is possible that we could lock with security this information so much that it's not very available. If it's not very available, like I said, that might affect the way in which we do business. Uh, and so we need to think about that. Some people will say that A stands for the authentication. I'll just say the auth because uh, authentication, authorization sometimes goes hand in hand in our discussions, uh, which is back to the who has access. Well, I am firmly the one that says availability is great. And, and let's put it this way, and, and let me explain. So if I were to say, okay, here's my asset, and uh, I look at the confidentiality. As I move towards 
more confidentiality, I'm moving away from availability. If I move, let's say, towards confidentiality and integrity as my main goal, I'm moving further away from availability. If I move more towards availability, do you get the picture? Then you're moving away from confidentiality and the, um, and the um, integrity part of this. And so there's a balancing act that we have to try to come up with. And it's not the easiest goal sometimes to come up with that idea. But that's why they kind of put it into a triad is so that you can get the picture of what the CIA is, but how when you overdo one area, I know that sounds weird, right? Overdo security. We, we could overdo security. I mean, if you really want something to be secure, you can store it on a hard drive and lock it in a bank vault or, you know, and post guards around it. But, you know, what'd you do? You lost availability at that point. Okay, another principle that we have to look at is least privilege. Least privilege is the idea that we give every user, everybody, including ourselves, only the permissions we need to do our job and no more. So let's uh, take a look at another common triangle. This one's called Active Directory. And uh, in Active Directory, we have these things called organizational units, and they might have some child organizational units. And uh, within those, uh, they have groups of users, and you know, on goes the, uh, the uh, uh, issue. Well, let's say that I have a user, and this user is assigned to an organizational unit that gives them permission to do whatever jobs that they need to do, because we can put security on that level and groups and the rest of it. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make this a Windows uh, class, but what would happen if that user says, hey, in order for me to do my job, there's a printer over here that is a part of this organizational unit that I need to use. Well, if we're not careful, we might have uh, an administrator or you know, a power user who says, oh, you know what, uh, I just want to get this done off my plate, get this ticket out of my way, and put them in that organizational unit so that they have access to the printer. Little did they know that they had the ability from there to create a line of credit to, uh, you know, for people to get loans because they didn't look at the documentation or understand why Active Directory was organized or why user groups were organized in a certain way. And so suddenly, we have a user who unknowingly to some administrator, might have more privilege than they are supposed to have. Whether or not they take advantage, whether or not they even know that there was a problem. If it was me, by the way, if, if that was me, I would know because I t typically tend to uh, uh, push the limits to see exactly what I have permission to do. Okay, job rotation. Job rotation is a kind of a different story. Um, and, and it's nothing to do with the, uh, the, the, the actual technical aspects. Um, but let's put it this way. Let's, uh, let's uh, see if I can draw this out. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, my bank building doesn't look uh, more professional. It looks more like a house. I realize that. And I've got a user over here who's uh, the manager of that uh, particular bank branch. And uh, after a while... Um, depending, again, I'm being maybe more pessimistic than I should. But after a while, this user might start to feel as though they are in charge of this uh, branch and start doing some things that might not be quite so legal. So what we would do with job rotation is we say, look, we're not demoting you. In fact, we're not saying we don't trust you. We are creating a policy that mandatorily says this manager, let's call him manager A, is now going to be transferred to this manager or this uh, branch bank branch, that was a tough one to say, and now they're going to run that one and we'll bring this new manager, maybe from another location, to run the branch that they were at before. Again, it's not a demotion, doesn't mean it's a promotion. What it means is that I now have a new set of eyes that can look to see what's happening inside of here and make sure everything was uh, going well, that the uh, maybe no embezzlement or those types of things. A and it also means that this same uh, manager A can do the same thing at this branch that they were just moved to. And so it gives us the ability to kind of put in a safety check that uh, you know, could otherwise occur when somebody uh, might start taking advantage of being in a uh, position of uh, authority for too long. Uh, and so that's kind of the idea. So that was my job rotation. Uh, kind of analogy. Dual control. All right, well, I already made a Star Trek reference, so you know I'm kind of a geek. And uh, another one of these things I'm, I'm uh, kind of a geek about are uh, these uh, uh, high-tech thrillers. And uh, 
And, and uh, you know, so without uh, sounding too offensive, let's uh, see how well I can uh, pretend that I'm drawing a rocket. And uh, that rocket can do damage everywhere if we're not careful. And the question then becomes, um, what happens uh, if uh, somebody who's watching this decides to fire this rocket? And so we create a system of dual control that says that this uh, person A can't by themselves launch it. Person B by themselves can't launch it, this rocket. But if they work together, and this is where those movies come in where you normally see like they both have like a key that they have to turn into a little lock and both turn it at the same time so there's an agreement and there might still even be a, a user C uh, over here who uh, has the launch controls or, or the, the codes that has to provide those uh, as well. And, uh, and so that's kind of the idea of dual control. Now you might say, well, you just went off the uh, reservation here, Ken. We're talking about networks. Yes, we are. Dual control and networks can uh, operate the same way. Um, you know, if you're thinking about uh, doing tape uh, backups or any type of backup, tape, storage area, whatever, you might have a user who has permission to back up files. One of the problems is, is that that person may be backing up files that they don't have permission to see. So we would give uh, the job of restore to a different user. And that way, one person couldn't back up the files and then restore them uh, onto a system that they could look at those files. Uh, it could be uh, maybe firewall administration that uh, it takes two people to uh, work, oops, FW, with the firewall uh, to administer it so that we are, uh, again, making sure there's no one person who might uh, accidentally, and remember, not every time I talk about security, I don't want to, you to assume I think that there's always people that are trying to sabotage you and your company. But, uh, but you know, whether they accidentally or purposely uh, allow some traffic in, it, it could be a bad thing for us. Uh, mandatory vacation to me kind of goes back to the idea of job rotation because again if I if I make it mandatory that you take a vacation now that doesn't mean I have to tell you when to take the vacation I just have to say yes you must take a vacation we give you vacation time so I want you to take a solid week off you take the solid week off and that assistant manager person can come in there and take a look at uh, what you're doing uh, as far as uh, you know how you manage the systems, how you know all of those really kind of cool things. Um, and you know, as much as I just talked about dual control, you know, the backup and restore firewall is probably the best example. The uh, rocket ship, I'm going to kind of put that down here. That's kind of that uh, separation of duties again.